Guys, this is Mubeen. We are talking about the respiratory pathology. Within that, we are covering pneumonias. This particular lecture, we will introduce the pneumonia, the definition, the classification of pneumonia, and then various pathogens that are involved in causing pneumonias in various settings. And then we will discuss those one by one in our next lectures. So, let us start. First of all, the definition of pneumonia. Pneumonia is broadly termed as any Thing, any infection of the lungs is called pneumonia. That is the broadest definition that we can go with. Now, classification. Understand one thing that for the classification, what is important is not to remember the classifications, but what is important is that you as a doctor be able to treat the patient. And for the treatment of pneumonia, it is important that you can quickly empirically start the treatment. For that, out of all of these classifications, what is important is to understand what is the clinical setting, what is the setting in which the patient became sick. Did the patient move around in the community? For example, did he go to school or office and came back and became sick? Or was the patient admitted in a hospital and became sick over there or got pneumonia over there? Does the patient work in military and got pneumonia there? Or is the patient an alcoholic or, or uh, immune compromised and so on? These settings give you clues for the type of pathogen faster than trying to understand the other classifications. So, keep this in mind. You have to see where the patient was. You have to try to establish that to start the antibiotics and treatment quickly. Of course, the culture and the right uh, understanding of the right pathogen is most important. So, let us start. First of all, clinical uh, classification of pneumonia. Clinically, pneumonia can be classified into acute, which of course means an immediate infection which needs attention, fulminant, which is also sort of acute and is really dangerous can progress and cause death. I actually had a patient in hospital uh, brought to me. I was working in the emergency room. Patient was brought in, child. And by the time they put the patient on my bed, and by the time I reached the patient, the child expired. And he had pneumonia. So, fulminant pneumonia is very dangerous. And then the chronic, chronic pneumonia. So, these are the clinical um, classification. Again, does it tell you that what is the treatment and how to approach the patient? Not really. It just tells you that how urgent it is that you start working with the patient. Histologically, the pneumonia can be divided in multiple types of pictures. One type is where the alveoli, so if I make Let us make a respiratory system here and let us say this is the alveoli. So, let us say these are the alveoli. Inside the alveoli, one histological picture is that we have lots of fibrino, so that is fibrous, fibrin, fibrino purulent, so lots of exudate is present, pus is present, fibrino purulent consolidation of the lung alveoli is present. So, alveoli, alveolus is filled with pus and fibrin and other inflammatory proteins and structures and cells. That is one. Then it is possible that alveoli are actually empty, but the septum, the interstitium, the parenchyma of the lung is inflamed. Normally, it is the atypical pneumonia. This is very dangerous as well because you would not see patient having cuff and pus and sputum and you might actually ignore it while the patient has a lots of uh, damage going on within the lungs interstitium. So, inter, uh, atypical pneumonia, what is more common here? Mostly it is caused by the viruses and that means mononuclear cells will be very common presence in this one. 
Then the third type histologically is the chronic pneumonia where there is continuous destruction of the lung tissue and there are big cavities and abscesses and granulomas that are present, for example, tuberculosis and other such things, aspergillus and candidiasis. So granuloma, granuloma, necrosis, cavitation, etc. present in the chronic. So histologically you might see a pattern from here to here. You might see pus, you might see atypical pneumonia or interstitial inflammation or you might see in the chronic cases the granulomas. Then is anatomic and radiographic classification. What is that? Very commonly seen. So here there are two basic types of that. One type is where more than one lobes of the lung are consolidated or affected by pneumonia, more than one lobe. So that is called bronco, bronco pulmonary pneumonia. On the other hand, if only one lobe is involved, if just one lobe is involved, then it is of course called lobar pneumonia. Now does it help? Is it useful? Is this setting useful? If I, if I have a patient that comes to you and I tell you that hey, this patient has lobar pneumonia versus bronchopulmonary, do, does that as a doctor help you? The only one help this gives you is that lobar pneumonia, 90% of the cases are by streptococcus pneumoniae. That's it. Otherwise, nothing much other than you being able to see, look at the radiograph and say, well, I think this is a lobar pneumonia or I think it is a bronchopulmonary pneumonia. All right. So not much use other than 90% of the lobar pneumonia being streptococcus pneumoniae. Clinical setting, this is the most important classification or syndrome which you should be working with. So I'm going to go and work here to represent various pathogens that are that cause pneumonia in various settings and then we'll discuss them one by one. So let's start. There are seven settings. These are called seven pneumonia syndromes. First is community. Community is schools, offices, workplaces, uh, running around in the bazaars and shopping malls and so on. So these are all community areas. Over there, the most, the pneumonias there or caused by interacting with others are divided into two types. One are called typical and the other one are atypical. Typical pneumonias, as we discussed over there here, these are the mucopurulent uh, or fibrinopurulent diseases with the consolidation of the alveoli and the lungs. Atypical are where the lung interstitium is inflamed, but the alveoli are mostly clear. So here, typical pneumonia is usually caused by streptococcus pneumoniae or pneumococcus, haemophilus influenza. Remember this high pi. Hemo haemophilus influenza inflames hair and causes the upper uh, respiratory tract infections, can cause pneumonia as well. And then uh, lower is the para-influenza virus, especially in the children. Then is the Legionella, of course, people who are um, gathered around in some community event and there is water coolers or there is air mist in the, on the vegetable racks in the shopping malls and so on. So related to the moist areas and community gatherings, Legionella. Moxicella is another that is very common and especially in the COPD patients, pa patients with the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it is very common uh, occurrence there. It causes acute exacerbation in the patients with the COPDs. Staph aureus. Another thing in the community acquired is the alcoholics can develop 
Klebsiella pneumonia more commonly. And the Klebsiella pneumonia, how do you figure that out? Your steps or the patient when, when he comes in, he would have current jelly, red current jelly like sputum. So very thick jelly like sputum. And the reason for that is that Klebsiella produces a lot of viscid capsular, uh, you know, secretions which look like jelly. So red current jelly is the, the verbiage, is the words that will be used in your question. Now atypical pneumonias, that is the interstitial pneumonias are mostly by the viruses, but of course other uh, pathogens, uh, bacteria are also involved. Mycoplasma is involved, chlamydia are involved, Coxella burnetti or the Q fever pathogen bacteria is involved. On the viruses side, respiratory syncytial virus in children, parainfluenza in children, influenza A and B in adults, especially in the, uh, in the older age and then adenovirus in the military folks, so the people who are working in the military, military barracks somehow have prevalence of adenovirus. So atypical mostly viruses and some bacteria as well. Now let's say the person got admitted in a hospital. So now we are at a nosocomial situation inside the hospital, nosocomial pneumonias. Most of these are gram negative rods. And Klebsiella is very common, E. coli is common, Pseudomonas is com common, and of course, I'm sure that you have heard about Staph aureus, from which the MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus is very common as well. Important thing here is alcoholics, once again, inside the hospitals, uh, or other folks who are uh, bedridden and may, maybe have a stroke and are unconscious, they might aspirate their oropharyngeal secretions that would have oral flora. So oral flora would also cause pneumonia in the people who are aspirating that may be alcoholics, they aspirate more often than others and secondly people who are bedridden because of strokes. So in them bacteroids, Parvotella, Fusibacterium, Staph, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Staphylococcus aureus and Pseudomonas are kind of the pathogens. Candida is also involved as well. If we go for the hospitals, ventilators are the most dangerous things. Patients on the ventilators have the highest propensity to develop pneumonias because of the nosocomial setting. Another uh, group of patients that develop pneumonias very commonly are asplenic patients. So patients who have developed damage to the spleen, maybe sickle cell disease, which has caused spleen damage. We'll discuss these very, very much in detail later on, one by one. I just want to introduce what are the pathogens. So asplenic patients or patients whose spleen have been removed or patients whose spleen has become damaged and non-functional. All of those cases, asplenic patients would have capsular pathogens will be more prevalent in them. And because spleen has the largest mass of macrophages, and the macrophages present here filter out the blood from the capsular pathogens. And so when the spleen is not present, those capsular pathogens just run around and cause pneumonias and other infections. For example, Klebsiella is very common in these patients. Streptococcus pneumoniae is very common and so they get repeated pneumonia and such infections. So that is the splenic patients. If we continue here, chronic pneumonia, pneumonias. So chronic nocardia, actinomycetes, and mycobacterium tuberculosis. These are the pathogens that can cause chronic pneumonias, which will then mean that they can cause nec necrosis of the lung tissue, cavitation of the lung tissue, and granuloma formations, for example, with the mycobacterium. Then specifically necrotizing pathogens that can cause necrosis. Klebsiella is very, very important. Streptococcus pyogenes is very important. Pneumoniae is very important, and Staph aureus is very important. So these can again cause necrosis and then cavitation. And finally, the seventh syndrome is the immunocompromised patients. That may be patients with HIV, that may be patients who you have kept immunocompromised because of the therapy or, or such other situations. So immunocompromised patients have common pneumonias with, uh, uh, with the fungi. So if you see here, cytomegalovirus, pneumocystis gerovesi, mycobacterium avium, 
candidiasis and aspergillosis is common pneumonia types that affect immunocompromised patients. So, here is a patient whose CD4 cell is running away. So, he is immunocompromised. So, these are the seven pneumonia type and why are they clinically important? Well, if you know the setting, the syndrome, then you can very quickly when and very reasonably figure out or suspect what kind of pathogen may be involved and you can immediately start treatment till you get further workup done and figure out what is the exact uh, pathogen involved. Cool? Thank you very much.